going to be in Exodus chapter 14 this morning. And uh, while, you're, while you're turning there, I just want to refresh your memory that tonight we're going to have the Williams Baptist drama team. We have one of the cast members with us this morning. She's right there. She thinks it's cold okay. in here. So uh, anyway, uh, but uh, yeah, they're they they're doing a good job. We went and watched um, we went and watched one of their one of their plays this week, and it was uh, uh, they did a good job. Um, I'm ex I'm excited for them uh, what they're doing, and excited that they're going to be coming here. We should be having a. a a few extra visitors tonight, as uh, we've uh, we tried to get the information out that they're going to be here, and, and of course uh, supporting Kaylin and you know in her efforts at college. I mean it's it's kind of a it's kind of a hard going to college, you know she doesn't have me there to make sure that she makes all the right decisions, and then she talks to the right people. You know she kind of has to learn some independence. It's tough. It's tough on me. To, to let loose some control, but yeah, she's uh, she's doing good, and I've met I've met many of the, of of the people that she hangs around with, and they're and they're, they seem to be like good good people. Uh, and those are tough to find these days. I don't know if you've tried here lately, but good people are tough to come by. Uh, but anyway, Exodus chapter fourteen, and. Um, just to kind of give you some context before we move into this, so that you kind of know what's going on, they Israel has they have they the the last plague has gone through the land of Egypt, and the firstborn of all of the Egyptians has been killed by the death angel. The angel of the Lord came through, and if the blood was not applied to the doorpost, the el the the firstborn of every household was killed that night. If the blood was not applied, the firstborn was killed. And they woke up the next morning to mourning and crying and, and just a lot of death as even Pharaoh's eldest son didn't make it through the night. He didn't have the blood applied to his life. So guess what he did? He had to face the death angel. And, uh, and we've talk, we talked about that. Well, now Pharaoh, Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron in, and he said, get out. He's so mad at them that he, he shakes his fist at them and says, get out. I never want to see you guys again. And Moses is like, it took you this long. Ten plagues devastated the land of Egypt. Egypt is destroyed. Egypt was destroyed five plagues back. Now the people are facing one of the hardest ships that they've ever faced. Can you imagine the firstborn of, of everybody? If you're the firstborn in your house, would you, would you raise your hand with me? Yeah, so that would have took out about, about one-fourth of everybody that's here. You'd have been done if you didn't have the blood applied to your life. So can you imagine... About 25% of the population are, are close to that. They're gone in one day. <clears throat> so we have, we have this going on. And, and Moses, they, they all, he gathers up Israel and they, they get out. And Moses, and Moses is reminded by God, Pharaoh, Pharaoh's heart is going to re-harden. He's going to come after you. And Moses gets the children of Israel, and they and they they travel through, and they're following. Remember the the as the scripture says that there's a cloud by day and a fire by night, and they just keep pressing forward. They stop for a little bit, a little bit to rest, but then they keep going. It doesn't matter if it's night or it's day; they just press forward, and they end up on this on the bank of the Red Sea. And they get there, and they turn around, and they can you picture? You see this dust cloud because Pharaoh. And his servants, they they come, they finally get over their morning, and, and they they hear that Moses has led the children to the bank of the Red Sea. There's nowhere for them to go. There's mountains surrounding them on, on one side, and on the other side, there's a sea. There's no escape for Israel. There's no hope. It, it looks like to Pharaoh. There's no way that they can escape us. 
So he gets 600 of his chariots and his warriors, and they mount up on their horses, and they go charging after Israel. And Israel can see the dust cloud coming because Pharaoh is pushing hard. He wants to destroy as many of, the, of Israel as he can because he suffered, he suffered great loss. He wants them to suffer great loss. And Israel and the, and the people of Israel, they look to Moses and they said, why did you lead us here? We're trapped. There's no way out. And is, is it because we didn't die in Egypt that you brought us out here to die here? And that's when God comes on the scene. When it seems hopeless. When it seems like there's no way of escape. God happens. Look what it says in verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. If you've been around long enough, you've, you've learned something about that word salvation in the Old Testament. Anybody remember? What's that, what's that Hebrew word for salvation? Somebody remembers, right? Nobody remembers? It's Yeshua. What is Yeshua? It's the same name as Jesus. So when you read salvation in there, you can automatically... Isn't, isn't that interesting how God works? Gave Jesus the name of salvation in the New Testament. And here we have that see the Yeshua of the Lord. Hey, if you're going to be saved from the armies of this world, you better look to Yeshua. You better look to salvation. You better look to Jesus because if you're looking anywhere else, you're going to face the same thing that Pharaoh and his army is about to face. He says, see the salvation of the Lord, which he, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more. And the Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. He says, sit back, watch me work. Watch me work. And he's, look at, look as he continues on. And the Lord said unto Moses, wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward, but lift up, but lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry land through the midst of the sea. And I behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh, and upon all his hosts, and upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. Will y'all pray with me? Dear Lord, I just want to ask that you would guide God, my thoughts this morning, God, all of our hearts, that we may be able to see your Yeshua this morning, that we would see your salvation, that we may be able to understand how to take what we see here in the scriptures and apply these things to our life. Will you guide us, Lord, in these things? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <coughs> Mike, will you go get me some water, please? I want you to look back at verse 15 with me. There's a very interesting phrase that God says to Moses. Moses and all of Israel, they are, they're up. They've got their, their face to the sea. They've got their backs to the mountains. And there's something going on. God says, go forward. Can you imagine that? You're looking, you're looking across this wide Spans of water. And God says, go that way. And you know, you can't, you're not, you're not going to, how are you going to do that? You've got no boats. You've got no vessel. You've got an army behind you. And God says, go. Go forward. Now, if you're going to look up this word, it means that you need, to pull, you need to pull out, pull up, set out, journey, remove, set forward, depart. That means, it means just like it, just like it means to your mind. Look that direction, march forward. You know, for Brother Bob and, my, and myself, and I, 
and whoever else is in the military, you you know, whenever you're standing in the ranks, and whoever's in your 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 squadron leader says forward march, and you know what you do, everybody at the same time will take that step forward, and they go. They go. I've been in times, Brother Bob, whenever somebody wasn't very good at directing us uh, a marching squadron. And, uh, well, they ran us over holes. And, and things happen whenever you go in the wrong direction. People fall down in front. And, and you don't know what's happening. And it's like we just start falling over each other like dominoes. It's a, turn into a train wreck really quick. And, but God says, I want you to march towards the obstacle. Because I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something that no one has ever seen. Because the world needs to know that I'm a God who can do the impossible. But see, there's always problems in it. Because God has told us to go. Jesus told us whenever he left, he said, go ye. Go forward. Don't stop. You have no, there are no excuses to you standing still because I have given you the command to go. You know what would happen in basic training if I decided, nope, I'm not listening to that guy whenever he says forward march. It would have been a very, very, very bad day for me. He would have given me plenty of showers of blessings that I did not want to receive. He would have been yelling and screaming in my ear. It would have been a bad day. Y'all just don't know if you've never been through that, how they can how they can chew you up and spit you out. Oh goodness, it brings back some horrible memories. So you know what we did when they said go. We went. We didn't delay. We marched forward. So here we have the setbacks to going forward that we see from the children of Israel. Look back in verse eleven. It's fear is a setback always to you going forward because God's told you to go forward. Look what it says. And it says, And they said unto Moses, Because there was no graves in Egypt, thou hast taken us away to die in the wilderness. Wherefore hast thou dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? They were alive in Egypt. And God has taken them to a place where if you go that way, it looks like you're going to drown. Do you realize that you could be in the most hazardous situation in your life, but when you're under the authority of the Almighty, that's the safest place you could actually be. You could go back to Egypt and you could die just like all your fathers did. You can stay in the world and you can have the pleasures and the sin of the world. And you know what Israel was doing back in Egypt? They were crying out to God, God, would you send us a deliverer? And then when they see the picture of salvation, and they and they and I don't know what they were thinking. You know, whenever we cry out for God to save us, we don't picture the Red Sea in front of us, do we? That's what's happening. And you know what? In your life, you know, that's why that's why American Christians are failing. Is because we keep crying out to God. But whenever, but God says, all right, I'll deliver you. And he puts a red sea in front of us. And we're like, oh, I didn't know he was going to take me to the bank of the red sea. I don't have the faith to step out and to cross the sea. So here we are. Here we are. We're ready to go back because I'm like, I just can't see how I'm going to get across there. And what you need is you need, you need some preachers in your life. You need some friends in your life. You need, some, you need some family in your life that says, yeah, God's brought you to the bank of the Red Sea. He's brought you to something impossible. But go forward and see the salvation of the Lord. He can get you through. I tell you, it takes some faith, right, to do that? You've got to know that he can do this. Don't be afraid. God has not given you that spirit of fear. If you feel afraid, you know what's going on? It's not from God. It's from something else. 
When God has told you to go and you're afraid, that fear did not come from the Almighty. It came from the devil. It came from an evil, wicked spirit that is messing with you. Because God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. According to 2 Timothy 1 and verse, I think it's verse 7. He's giving you this. He is not giving you that spirit of fear. Go forward. And then we see that Israel had some wrong thinking going on, too. This is another setback to you being able to go forward with your Christian life. Is that you think you're you're thinking wrong. Look at verse 12. And it says, is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. They got wrong thinking all through the scriptures. God gets on to Israel and, and, fellow, and fellow believers alike. Don't think wrongly. When you start thinking like the world, your mind's being messed up. It's being manipulated by some other things that's going on. Don't think wrong. Think righteous. Think holy. If you're thinking wrong, it's probably because you're looking on things that aren't godly. You're looking on some other things. Don't have wrong thinking. 2 Corinthians 10 and 5 and 6 says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and, bring, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Cast down out down those imaginations don't think wrong you see how israel is thinking wrong god says i'm here to save you and they're like no we just wanted to be left alone did you really you want to be a slave your whole life for you want your children to be slaves is that what you want that's what we've got going on in our country right now do you want the next generation to go down this, this path that we seem to be going on, there's only one way to prevent it. And that's to quit thinking wrong. It's to cast those things down. Put away those, those evil imaginations and, and those things that exalteth itself against the Most High. We need, a, we need a, a good group of believers that believes God is the Most High and He can do anything that he is the most powerful and we need to rely on him and quit relying on all the other stuff that we are relying on all if you're trusting in something besides god to get you through there's some wrong thinking going on and it's going to be a setback in your life when god says you need to go forward they're also blind look at verse 13 and moses said unto the people Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he shall show you today. You see, they cannot see past their limitations. All they see is the Red Sea, and they see the mountains, and they see the Egyptian army heading out them. They cannot see any way out of this. How many of you got saved before you hit the bottom of your life? Most of you felt like you probably hit the bottom, didn't you? That, there, that you needed help. There, that, that you got to a place where there's only one way that I'm getting up. And that's if somebody reaches down and gets me. And that somebody is the Almighty. And here we have, they can only see their limitations. They cannot see any other way. They can't see past that. Remember the scripture in Isaiah that says that God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. You see, you're limited to this, to whatever you can see, feel, and think. But you got to remember, as a believer, you are, when you are working in the spirit, you start working outside the realms of the physical, and you start working in the realm of the spiritual. That's why prayer is important. That's why miracles are real. That's why salvations really do happen. That's why there really is a God and he works in the affairs of mankind. And he wants to work in your life. And he says, go forward. Don't let there be any setbacks in your life. Don't be blind. To, don't be blind like the Israel was here. 
they couldn't see how God could save them. And you know, and that's because they're stuck looking at the physical. There's like, it is impossible for us to go that way, Moses. Don't you see all the water? What are you going to do with all that water, Moses? And God comes on the scene. <clears throat> it, Ephesians 4, 17 through 18. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts. You see, the rest of the world, they have that right to look across the Red Sea and say that there's no way to get across that. We can't do it. But you, as a believer, do not have that right because you're serving someone who can work on the outside of the limitations of this world. We're talking about the creator of the universe. We're talking about the one who created and designed you. If he could create and design you, he can make a path for you to escape. He can make a way for you to make it through. No matter what the issue is in your life, he will get you through. It may be that he gives you more grace. It may be that he sends an east wind and dries up the Red Sea and parts it so that you can go right across. And you go through the waters. You realize that's what baptism is? Is whenever you go through the waters? Is that you die to yourself. And you go through the waters of God and you come out on the other side as a new person. That's what Israel is going to do. They were going to die to their self in Egypt. They were going to go through the waters of the Red Sea, baptize and come out on the other side, a nation devoted to the Almighty. And when you're baptized, that's the way you should be. You should go down into the water and come up a new person dedicating your life to the Almighty, no matter what. And rejecting all the setbacks in your life and knowing that I must Go forward because that is God's command. Look back with me in verse 15. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ unto me, Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. You know why that you can go forward? You know, if you can get past all the setbacks in your life, if you can get, and most of those things are lies. You know, they're lies that somebody's told you or lies that you've told yourself or lies that the world is, is just trying to beat you up with. you got to know this fact. Look in verse 14. The Lord shall fight for you. You realize that when you have dedicated yourself to the Lord, you become his property. You belong to him. If anybody messes with you, they're messing with God's property. Let me ask you something. If you had somebody come to your house and you saw them outside busting up your vehicle with a baseball bat, what would you do about that? Are you just going to sit by and just let them do it? Or are you going to try to do something about it? You'll at least call the police, right? If you've got a 12 gauge in, in, inside, you might, you might encourage them to leave. You know why? Because that's your property. And you're going to protect your property. It doesn't matter who you are. Nobody likes their property messed with. Nobody likes being violated like that. And when somebody is messing with you, they're messing with God's property. And he feels the same way about them messing with you as you feel about somebody messing with your car. You're like, well, that's just a car. Mm -hmm. You're more valuable than a car. It's kind of like if somebody, if, I, if somebody was messing with my daughter and I saw that, well, it's not going to be a good day. Somebody's not making it home that night. Right? Yep. Y'all are tracking with me? Some of y'all know how I feel. If it was your grandkid, you'd feel the same way. If it was your wife, you'd feel the same way. Maybe if it was a husband. You know, I, I, can't, I can't imagine, you know, what somebody would do if, 
if Sister Louise saw somebody messing with Bob, right? What? <laughs> just, the, just the look would get him. Look, you would not, you, you, you know, if, you, if you've got some kind of ownership and you feel anything, like they don't need to be doing that, look, you're going to try to protect it. God feels the same way. He put that inside of you because that's the image of the Almighty. Here it is. God says it. He's got that same feeling about you too. God's going to fight for you because you're worth it. You're valuable. In fact, you're so valuable that God would become flesh. Dwell, dwell among mankind. He would take on this this. this this body that's weak and feeble and able to hurt, he would be willing to take on that to die for your sins so that you could go to heaven. That's how much God values you. He cares that much for you. You think if he cares that much for you, that if you're his, that he would just let somebody mess with you? Without wanting to do something about it? Oh yeah, God says, I will fight for you. You're worth it. You're mine. You're valued. Romans 8.31 If God be for us, who can be against us? The Egyptian army doesn't stand a chance. The Red Sea is not an obstacle to the Almighty. Now, it is tough whenever you're thinking in a worldly physical th stance, like there is no way. We can't fight the army. We can't fight the state. We can't fight the forces of nature. You don't have to. God says, I'm going to fight it for you. If God is for you, nothing can be against you. Not the forces of nature. Not the forces of the state. God will fight for you. Look at verse 15. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, Wherefore criest thou to me? Why are you crying? Quit. Quit crying about it. You're complaining about all these things. And I've said, Go forward. Quit whining to me, Moses. Children of God, why are you crying about so many things? You know, we spend more time crying about things than we do going forward. What if we just went forward and let God deal with the issues? He would. He would. Look back in history. The Roman Empire against 12, 11 Jewish guys. And they turned the world upside down. Did they have an army against the state? Nope. You know what they did? Everywhere they went, they shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. They told their story. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about what he did for me. Let me tell you how he saved my soul and forgave me of my sins. And one by one, one at a time, as they preached the gospel, wherever they went, they were following the simple command, go ye, go forward. They changed the world. That's where we got to get back to. We've gotten so much, we've gotten so much in the mud where we're trying, we're trying to make life better for everybody. What we need to do is we need to get back to the basics of just being able to share the gospel with our friends and our neighbors and people that we meet along the way. Are there a couple people in your life that you're trying to mentor and disciple? They don't have to be strangers. All the, most of you, you've got friends and you've got family that they would fit that criteria. They need Jesus. What are you doing to reach them? Do everything that you can to reach them. Go forward. And you know what you'll find? 
The more you try to reach them, the more opportunities God sends you to reach strangers. And God really can change the world with just a few folks. He's done it in the past. I mean, we're, we're looking at a nation right here. It, it began with one guy, Abraham, just a couple hundred years before. And now it's about to rock the Egyptians' world because they would not believe and they wanted to persecute God's people. And they have called up the vengeance of the Almighty upon them. They've already faced the ten plagues. And now we have water on both sides. And they think it's a good idea to keep chasing these guys that God's fighting for. How do you think that's going to end? Not well. You know, there's still Egyptian chariot wheels in the bottom of the Red Sea. They're still there. They didn't make it to the other side. Only the believers that went through the baptism were. They're the ones who made it. So quit crying about all these things. Isaiah 35, 4. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong. Fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. And how do you feel about that? Do you need a savior today? Is this world picking on you? You need Jesus. You need Jesus. He will save you. You don't have to have a fearful heart. Be strong. Your God will come with a vengeance and save you. Look at verse 16. When you decide that, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going to go forward. But lift up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry land through the midst of the sea. You see, when you're a believer, God's giving you some gifts. He's giving you some talents. He didn't say, all right, you're a believer. Have fun. And he throws you to the wolves. He doesn't do that. He gives you the things that you need and require to make it through this life. And he says, use them. Lift them up to God. That's what he's telling Moses. He's like, I gave you that rod. Remember back in Mount Sinai? He said, it's no longer your rod, Moses. It's my rod. And he, every time he used it for God, something amazing happened. Sometimes it turned into a snake. Other times it turned the Nile River and all of its waters into blood. And now God says, lift up thy rod towards the sea and watch it divide the waters. Do you think if God can give Moses a stick like that, that, he, that with you he's giving you the Holy Spirit, that you should be able to part these waters of life with no trouble at all? You shouldn't get so bogged down in this life. You shouldn't get so bogged down in the sin. What's, what's holding you back? I'll tell you what's holding you back is that you're not using those gifts and those talents for God. Use what God has given you. Romans eleven twenty nine. 29. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God's not saying he's made a mistake. He doesn't look at you and say, oh, I made a mistake. He didn't. I didn't make a mistake when I gave you the Holy Spirit. I didn't make a mistake when I gave you those gifts and talents. You're making a mistake when you don't use them for my honor and my glory. Philippians 3, 13 through 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto the things which are done before. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. You see, Paul says, I have put all those things that was in my past behind me, and I'm marching forward towards the prize. If you're going to let what's happened in your past hold you back, you're failing the gifts and the calling of God. They're, remember, they're without repentance. He didn't make a mistake when he chose Paul. Paul was a murderer. Do you realize that? He murdered Christians. He took he took fathers and mothers away from their children. He orphaned them. And God and Paul here, he says, those things were in my past. 
But uh, in the future, I see that I have a higher calling where I'm not trying to murder and to separate people, but I'm trying to bring them closer to the Almighty. And I've used those gifts that God has given to me for His honor and for His glory. And He doesn't—he doesn't say, "Oh, I have—I haven't—I haven't—I haven't, I haven't made it to perfection yet. I still have some work to do, but I'm not hold, I'm not letting my past hold me back. I'm pressing forward." And I'm going to get better every day because I'm not looking at myself. I'm looking to the one who can part waters. And this is what we see. We need to go on. We need to go forward into what seems impossible. You know what? I realize when you look at a sea, when they were looking at the Red Sea, it looked impossible. The whole situation looks impossible, right? There's many of you here that you've been in situations that looked impossible. But there's hope. But that hope is in Jesus Christ. Matthew 19, 26. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible. With God all things are possible. I realize that the context may not be ex exactly like what it's pointing to here. It's talking about the eye of a needle, but it, it, means this, it means what it means all the time. That what in your mind you have said, it cannot happen, it can't be. There's no possible way with God. There's always a way. And seas are not obstacles to the Almighty. Armies wanting to destroy you are not an obstacle to God. The whole state being against you is not a problem with God. China should really get a no catch a note on this. Because they've been fighting against Christians for a long time. For about 60 plus years. And you know what they're facing? By 2030, that there's going to be more Christians in China than in the rest of the world. That is... What's the obstacle? The real obstacle is when you are against God's people, God is going to wage vengeance on you. And if the state is against, its, against God's people, God will wage war on the state. America better get a clue too because America is starting to turn in that direction. Woe to the state of America if it finally goes against God's people and starts declaring that what we're doing as an unconstitutional event. Have you realized what's happened? That's what they did during COVID. And what's happening to our government? Well, we're looking at wars on all kinds of different sides right now. Why? Because the leaders have turned their back on God and they've turned their face against it. And they said it's more important to fight a war, fight a war on the church than it is against the war on all those other problems. And you know what's going to happen? The same thing that happened to Egypt. But for God's believers, he will get you through. So don't get, don't start crying about all that stuff. March forward. That's where your hope is. That's where your eyes need to be because with God, all things are possible. How are you going to do this? How are you going to do that? You're like, that. that's an awesome message, Brother Mitch. I wish I could think like that. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2 tells you how to do this. It says, set your affections on things above, not things on the earth. Remember, this world is not your home. You're just passing through. You're here for a little bit. Use your gifts and your talents to serve the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Be the witness that God has called you to be. He's given you those gifts without repentance. He wants you to have those. He wants them, you to use them for the benefit of the gospel. Don't get distracted by all this nonsense going on around this world. It looks like craziness to us, but it's not a problem with the Almighty. Armies of the state don't stand a chance. 
and where it seems like it's an impossible path, God can divide the waters and make you to walk across on dry ground. You know how you do that? Keep your eyes on him and go forward. That's what you've got to do. As a song leader and the pianist come, Could you do that? Can you do what God has asked you to do? Can you go forward? Have you set your affections on things above? Well, the first thing you need to do, if you're going to set your affections on things above, you got to make sure I am his property. I belong to the, to the Almighty. I'm his. Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Have you said, I depend on him 100% or are you holding back? If you're holding back, you're not really his. You've got to sell out. You've got to give in. What's holding you back? You're going to be like, you're going to be, you're going to be like that, that raccoon that's got, his, uh, that's got his hand inside of a jar and it's stuck. He, he really wants whatever's in that jar and it's stuck in his hand and he can't get his hand back out. Are you going to be like that? Are you going to let go so that you can be saved? So God can use you and actually give you something that's worth it. His Holy Spirit is without repentance so that you can reach others for the cause of the Gospels. Do you know that Jesus loves you? Do you know that he died for your sins? Do you know that you know that you know that you're saved? And that if you die today, you would go to heaven. Do you know that? If you don't, today's the day. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. Man, my uncle, he was just fine the other day. My dad was saying, I just talked to him. He sounded fine. And in a moment, you could be, on a, you, you could be knocking on heaven's door. One foot on the other side of eternity. You see, these bodies are fragile. Are you prepared for eternity? Are you ready to meet Jesus? That's what you need to do every day. You need to wake up and say, I am ready to meet my maker. And if I don't meet him today, I'm going to live for him today. The scripture says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in your heart that he's raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Are you able to go forward? Pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Lord, I ask that everyone here, that they know you as their Lord and Savior and that they can do what you've asked them to do, to go forward, to go into all the world with your gospel and that the obstacles that are before them are not obstacles in their mind, but they've cast away the fear. They've cast away the wrong thinking. They've cast away the blindness, and they see you as the most powerful and the one who can get them through no matter what. Help us, Lord, to see you in this light and have this understanding. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.